Well, we have seen this before. A young man who seemingly has it all causes a tragedy that is difficult to comprehend. A blog reportedly written by the shooter is providing few clues. As recent as July 13th, there's an entry that says this. Take a look. Brothers and sisters, don't be fooled by your desires. This life is short and bitter, and the opportunity to submit to Allah may pass you by. Joining me now to discuss all of this, Harris Afar, the national spokesperson for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA. He's also the vice president of the group's uh, Youth Association. Association. And also joining me is, of course, Cedric Alexander, CNN law enforcement analyst. Thank you so much for being here with us. Harris, I'm going to Thank start so with you. We just looked at that, the um, quote from the blog that he wrote in the, in the days leading up to the shootings. What do you make of that right. posting? Yeah, so I read through the blog, um, and uh, of course, it's allegedly his. We're still waiting for confirmation. Only two posts made on the same day, three days before the attack. And when you combine this, you can't look at anything in a vacuum, obviously. So when you combine this with his other behavior, being arrested uh, for drunken driving, so being under the influence of alcohol, of other intoxicants, of being high, um, and then obviously this violent actions, and then his life before, what we see is a, a youth that has a crisis in his path, uh, not really understanding what his life is. He has staunchly religious parents, but he is performing actions like being high and drunk that are strictly, strictly forbidden in Islam. So you see him uh, in one end being very un-Islamic with behavior, and then suddenly you see him um, going to the mosque, and then suddenly he's arrested again, and then suddenly he, now three days before the attack, he posts these things about being in the path of Allah. And then three days later, he commits the most carnal sin, which is taking an innocent life. So what we see is a youth that doesn't really have an identity um, and doesn't have a sense of belonging. And that's where, within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, what we say is that's where leadership matters, because uh, the leadership is what is going to set a direction for these naive and, uh, and uh, discontented youth. And so what, what are the leaders doing out there to guide them towards the right path? That is the big question. Cedric, to you, I want to listen to what House Homeland Security Committee Chairman Michael McCall just said in a news conference. Let's take a listen. I would think that particularly in the light of the events that occurred yesterday, that recruitment centers and training centers need to heighten their sense of security as well, including the idea of, of having armed personnel to defend themselves. Um, I think, you know, as the gentleman pointed out, they're very, very soft targets which may be precisely why this individual chose that target, because realizing you can get on this base, uh, a training center is a lot easier to hit. It's a much uh, softer target. Cedric, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely I do. But let me start by saying this first, Brooke. Uh, my hearts and prayers go out to the families and friends of those U.S. Marines who lost their lives on the homeland. Uh, absolutely I agree. Soft targets such as those recruiting centers Oftentimes, all of us know they are situated in our communities, in our cities across this country, and they're where many of our young people go to learn information about becoming uh, a military uh, man or woman, and those targets are very soft, and generally, simply meaning they're very uh, unsecured. So I think there's going to need to be, and I hope there's some going to be some conversation going forward in which we're going to look at maybe hardening those targets in a way uh, to the extent where well, those uh, uh, military personnel have some way of protecting themselves. We live in a very, very different time now, and I think we have to certainly take that under consideration in light of what we're seeing that's happening domestically and also what is being uh, influenced upon this country internationally as well, too. Well, let's talk about that, Cedric, because there are these gun-free zones in the military, these recruitment centers, they don't have um, at weapons, and, and only certain people on bases can have weapons. Do you think they need to take a, uh, a closer look at that and perhaps change that? And why does, why does this have to happen after such a, a tragedy like this for, for security to be boosted at these, you know, military facilities? Well, I think, Pamela, you, you, you know, here again, we have not had this experience in which we're seeing in this country today. This is a very different time. There was a time, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida. I remember being in high school going by the U.S. Marine Corps uh, recruitment center trying to decide whether I want to go in Marines or go to college. It's just something that's part of our communities. But we cannot, and I would hope going forward, we don't have our men and women who are servicing us uh, in those facilities in that community uh, not being able to protect themselves. 
uh, we're just in a very, very different time today. And I'm quite sure there's going to be some conversation going forward uh, up on the hill in regards to how do we better prepare these soft targets that are situated in our environment in light of the fact uh, we have so much uh, uh, domestic influence of terrorism and of course we're being influenced internationally as well too. We can no longer sit by and uh, just think this is going to pass. We're in a very, very different place today. We are and we've been hearing for months that, that military facilities could be the target of a terrorist attack and it just makes you wonder why now that we're starting to boost the security. Harris, I want to go to you for any final thoughts you may have. I saw in some of the comments you made that, that you made it clear that, that his faith is not what drove him to do this. What do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's the combination of his own erratic behavior uh, throughout his life, not just you know, this uh, single blog post or the fact that he went to a couple of mosques. Uh, his er erratic behavior uh, and combined with the, what we understand to be the true teachings of Islam. I mean, we have to peel the layers of the onion following the guidance. So, uh, like, like I said, leadership matters. The international Khalifa, the one and only Khalifa of Islam, the worldwide spiritual leader of the largest body of Muslims, organized Muslims in the world, has, has called us towards understanding true Islam. And when we do that, we understand that it calls us for service of mankind, of, uh, of peace and reconciliation. So when you understand that, and that's what we do when we work with Muslims around the country, we have servicemen uh, in, in our community. Uh, and within the Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association, we've had many uh, who have served this, this nation honorably and were honorably discharged. And so Absolutely. when we see that, we, we understand that it's not the faith. And we have millions of us that are driven to become better and more civic-minded members of society because of our faith, not in spite of it. So this is not, I, I would be very hard-pressed to ever believe anyone to say that Islam or any religion was truly at the core of what inspired them. Uh, it's always a political, social, psychological matter, and that's what all the, the experts in the field have said, su such as the, the, study of, the Center for the Study of International Terrorism. Harris Safar, Cedric Alexander, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And up next in the newsroom, thank you.